All right, hello and welcome to another edition of Cultural Conversations with the Big South. I'm your host, Darius Thigpen, and we have a pair of special guests here with us today. We have an elected official working to make the changes needed at the legislative level, and we have a floor general from a senior, a senior guard from Campbell men's basketball team. So we'll start with the guard, Jordan Whitfield. How are you doing today? Doing good. How about yourself? Doing well, man. And we also have a former student government president, graduate from Winthrop, at least for his undergrad, and most recently receiving his master's, completed law school, and a member of the South Carolina House of Representatives, Cambrell Garvin. Cambrell, thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me t today. All right, so let's go ahead and get the conversation kicked off. So let's start with the topic of voting. So Jordan, on August 28th, the official Twitter account of Campbell's Athletics put out a tweet saying that they were partnering with the Student Athlete Advisory Committee to help with voter registration. Uh, I, I believe it was just three weeks later, you guys, the entire athletics department, all the student athletes, 100% registered to vote. Your men's basketball team really led that effort being the first ones to get to that mark. Um, starting with the effort to get everyone on board to get registered to vote, how did that kind of go for you guys as student athletes and you being one of the leaders in that initiative? Oh uh, yeah, definitely. Um, I appreciate Campbell for um, the support and having us. But they uh, they kind of pushed Campbell University, kind of made it like a like a race to getting the one hundred percent voting registered to vote. So um, yeah, so once they did that, they reached out to the, all the the program or the athletes and stuff. So then we took it upon ourselves to make it a priority to get the team registered. The leaders on the team, we I know Austin McCullum, the other senior on the team, uh, he reached out like every single day to the players, just telling them to uh, get registered to vote, just pushing that conversation so they can get be registered to vote. But yeah, I, I'm thankful for, for the university for showing the support. Now, getting registered to vote is one of those things that sometimes it can be, because it's like an administrative paperwork type thing, it can be put to the back burner. Did you kind of have to press down on anyone and say, hey, make sure you fill it out. Hey, make sure you go do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know a um, couple guys, because, um, you know, they procrastinate a lot, but a couple guys. So Austin, definitely, I'm, I'm, pr I'm thankful for him and what he did in his effort into getting us registered to vote. That's great. Now, when it comes to voting, of all of the efforts that you guys have put in, because one of the other topics we're going to bring up tonight is, uh, the fight against racism that you have helped lead. Um, how much do you think voting kind of goes into that fight, going in and affecting positive change in the polls? How much do you think that voting matters in all of that? Yes, um, it's definitely important. Um, I mean, it's a way for us to exercise our right and um, exercise our voice and be heard. Uh, it's the voice of the people using your vote and just creating change with your vote because it's, it's important to um, elect the right officials and give, elect the right people in power to uh, make change in the nation. Now, switching to the elected official in the room, one of those guys who's been the beneficiaries of that right to vote, Cambrell. So obviously getting people to vote and getting them pe people registered to vote and then turning up to vote and of course voting for you, that's all a part of your job. Um, when you look at the organization efforts at the grassroots level that you see from student athletes like Jordan to get people registered to vote, how much of that do you look at and just say like, okay, the, the next generation, they're going in the right direction. How, how, how proud of you are, are, are you of that, those types of efforts? Yeah, absolutely. And great question, Darius. I, I am actually inspired uh, by the work that we see young folks uh, and student athletes like Jordan and his teammates and others doing. Uh, because if you look at every movement for social justice or civil rights in this country and truly around the world, those movements have been fueled by a desire uh, for young people uh, for change in their communities. Um, and you look at the civil rights movement, you know, Dr. King and, and so many others, John Lewis, uh, they were, you know, 
you know, they were supported by young, uh, young adults and students uh, who were tired of the status quo. Uh, John Lewis, who, as you all, are, I'm sure, are, are know, you know, recently passed, and he talked about getting into good trouble. And I think uh, good trouble to me is folks getting out there and uh, making their voices heard uh, in peaceful demonstrations uh, by registering to vote and that sort of thing. Um, I actually got my start, uh, in, you know, at, at an early age, I think at the age of 10, uh, where I, is where I hosted my first voter registration a rally at my church. And uh, I couldn't vote myself, but I just recognized at an early, early age, the power and the importance of, of our votes. And I think if you look historically, uh, we can certainly see, you know, that access to the ballot box hasn't always been easy for every community uh, in, uh, of people in this country. Uh, but I think we can't take it for granted. And I'm certainly glad to see this new generation uh, of leaders stepping up uh, and, and rising to the occasion and registering voters uh, and really being the change that they want to see. Well, Cambrell, I mean, you, you, you say that so well um, for young people to get out and vote and understand what they're voting for. And, you know, let's be honest, we're, we're both under 30, so we can still consider ourselves to be young people Absolutely. as well. But um, when you look at not just young people, but there's a number of people in general who kind of have this thought that their personal vote doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether or not they show up or they feel like, you know what, whoever I elect, it's going to be the same type of system that keeps going. So from your perspective, both as a social advocate and of course as an elected official, uh, how would you describe the importance of each individual vote to someone who kind of feels like, ah, it doesn't really matter for me? If you look at the 2016 presidential election, uh, we saw that that election came down to the electoral college. Um, and we saw that three states, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania decided that election. 30,000 voters in those three states chose uh, the president of the United States because of our system uh, uh, utilizing the electoral college and not the popular vote here. 30,000 people decided that race. 30,000 people decided that race. And you're talking about, and I emphasize that because uh, you're talking about millions you know, of people that actually got out and voted. Um, I oftentimes tell the story during my first race two years ago here in South Carolina, I took on a 20 year political incumbent when I ran for the state house. And in South Carolina, in order for you to win a race, you have to have 50 plus one or 51 percent of the vote. Uh, but we were in a four way race and the incumbent had 36 percent of the vote and I had 36 percent of the vote. And what, what that means is that he had seven more votes than I did. Just seven. Had that been the end of the process and had, you know, and had there not been a runoff that we had to have, have you know, that would have been the end of the race and I would have had to have uh, gone home and lick my wounds and maybe try again next time. But seven votes uh, could have ended, you know, my entire uh, career. So when I tell people that every vote matters, I, you know, I know firsthand, you know, because I would have, have gone home and thought, well, you know, seven more people that I could have called or seven more people that, you know, that I, I knew personally, you know, that, and that didn't show up. So never take your vote for granted because it truly does count. Cambrell, I mean, I'm, I'm sure for you as a politician, you would want people to show up as informed voters, not just people showing up just to check a box, right? Oh, oh, oh definitely. I, I think, I think to your point earlier, uh, I think it's well, number one. It's really important to be an informed voter. Uh, oftentimes, what we see happening is people vote party line, and um, while you know, I think you know, as a partisan, I am a partisan. I don't want to fool anybody. I think you know, if, if that party, as Jordan said, you know, lines with your principles, but then by all means support, you know, those individuals. But I, I do think it's important to be able to, you know, go into the uh, ballot box and decide based upon the issues which candidate you know best aligns with what you believe and who's been doing the work uh, you know and, and that sort of thing. I oftentimes share that local elections are so so important. I know that we put a lot of emphasis every four years on the presidential election and don't get me wrong uh, those are those are important you know because you know that's our face to the world our president is but I think local elections are the races that 
you know, that impact our quality of, of life the most. For example, up in Flint, Michigan, the, the citizens don't have uh, quality drinking water. Here in Denmark, South Carolina, there's a similar situation in regards to the drinking water. Those sorts of decisions are coming from a local government level as well as a state government level. And so, you know, being able to go out and make your voices heard in those elections is, is really key because roads and education and healthcare access all are, you know, come from oftentimes the local level. Okay, well, we're recording this uh, on the 8th of October, so still about a little less than a month away from Election Day. But uh, for each of you, starting with Jordan, uh, have you cast your vote yet? I have not. So how do you plan on voting? I'm doing the absentee ballot vote, so. Yeah, certainly tough to, to get away from a college campus. Um, kind of, I'm going to stick with you for a second. A, a number of your college teammates, so your basketball teammates, um, come in from out of state. Um, so it's something that a lot of student athletes can understand, and college students in general. Um, you're not going to be able to just drive home and go vote at the nearest um, library or anything like that. You have to do the absentee uh, ballot. So how many of your teammates do you know um, are looking to vote by mail? Uh, pretty pretty much majority of them, I believe. I think pretty much every single one of them actually is doing absentee ballot vote. And that's, I mean, that's something that uh, we'll certainly um, talk a little bit about, uh, Cambrell, because uh, during the pandemic, uh, a number of people, even who are close to uh, their local poll, are choosing to go the absentee ballot uh, route just because we're in the middle of a pandemic. It's the reason why we're all in these different squares on Zoom rather than being in the same room together. So when we look at that issue and that topic coming up, um, we've had absentee ballots and mail voting for years and years, but we're seeing an increase in use of it and it's getting a lot of attention in the news. Can you just kind of explain to anyone who may not exactly know how it goes, what that process looks like for absentee ballot, or at least you can um, describe it for us for what it is in South Carolina? Yeah, cer certainly. Well, I can take it uh, from a national standpoint. Uh, so, so yes, absentee balloting is nothing, or voting by, by voting by mail is nothing new. Um, folks have been utilizing this process for a long time. Uh, Jordan and so many of, of his fellow teammates are voting by mail because uh, oftentimes people are, are living, college students especially, are living in one place um, for school or attending, you know, but their permanent residence is somewhere else. Uh, but, you know, I think voting by mail has unfortunately been politicized this election cycle and it really shouldn't have been given the fact that we are in the middle of a once in a lifetime 100 year pandemic uh and, and, and you know so you know i have an elderly aunt who's 87 and, and who you know you know has been requesting her absentee ballot for a long time uh and she was able to do it here in south carolina because of her age and i'm sure many other states have that kind of uh caveat as well but now um, so many states, I want to say over 40 states or so, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, anybody can vote, ab can, can, vote ab can vote absentee. So as a result of that, I think that we're going to be seeing longer voting lines. I think that, uh, well, I think, you know, as a, you know yeah, we're going to be seeing longer voting lines on election day, potentially, as well as uh, maybe a delay in some of our election results as a result of so many folks participating uh, in the process absentee uh, versus in person. But I encourage everybody to get their votes in early. Uh, this election is so crucial that we, you know, make our voices heard. Um, you know, the post, the postal service has had some challenges in recent weeks, uh, and so I just encourage you, if you do decide to uh, uh, to vote, um, either vote by mail, get your ballot in now, or as soon as possible, or, or you know, as further as far away from election as possible, or if you live in an area. Where you're close enough to drop your ballot off at the polling place, I certainly encourage you to do that as well. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I think that's a key point. A lot of people may not know that you can actually get your absentee ballot, fill it out at home, and then just go and drop it off. And that's happening in a, a lot of uh, locations, certainly as here in Florida. Um, Jordan, uh, Canberra brought up a point about uh, going and voting early, um, just to make sure that everything goes smooth. Uh, have you talked to your teammates about that at all, about when everyone should be uh, filling out their absentee ballot and sending it off in the mail. Uh, we have not talked about that so far, but I'm sure we will in the future. But okay. um, I did uh, last election, 
I voted early. I went into a church in Raleigh and uh, voted early. And it wasn't, I mean, the lines weren't really long, but I do encourage early voting, though, definitely. I know you'd be amazed by how, how streamlined that process is and how easy it is to just yeah. go and vote a couple weeks early, honestly. Yeah. All right. Well, Jordan, um, one thing about uh, the reason why we have you on uh, today as well, you're not just going out and saying, hey, go ahead and vote. You've also been a big part of the solution at the local level in fighting against racism. You were part of the protests in Raleigh in the wake of the shooting of Jacob Blake earlier this summer. Now, for all the people who have their opinions on protests, but who have never actually been to one, they don't know what it actually means to be in one of these peaceful protests. Can you tell us what the atmosphere was like at the one where you were? Yeah, um, the atmosphere was amazing. Uh, first, I want to shout out my Milbert coaches for putting together this protest and allowing me to join them. But yes, the atmosphere was amazing. Just seeing the different races and ages and just demographics of people galvanizing together to promote change is, is just amazing because it wasn't just one race it was everyone stepping in of all ages and that's when real change uh comes when different races and age groups and stuff come together and and when you were there how much was it um understood by everyone who was there why they were there it wasn't like it was just some people growing up and saying oh we got a march going on let me join in like was everyone well aware why they were there and felt the importance of it yeah from what i from what i've seen and felt in the atmosphere they were definitely there for a reason mm -hmm. and um just the chance was just amazing um but yeah i felt everyone was there they knew why they were there and because it was it was just perfectly led all the chance started right time. You know, it was just, it was just amazing experience. Definitely, I encourage people to go out there and fight, and get in the streets and protest. But the message of uh, unity and, and moving things forward in the right direction certainly sounds like that was a big part of it. Well, all right. Well, Camberell, when it comes to the topic of protests, mm -hmm. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote extensively about it and how it figures into social change in Letter from a Birmingham Jail. Um, he talked uh, out against negative peace, you know, that lack of tension um, that is belied by uh, a lack of justice. Great reggae artist, uh, Peter Tosh, he says it in a different way. Um, I ain't crying out for peace, I'm looking for equal rights and justice. Mm -hmm. So when you look from the perspective of an elected official, mm -hmm. someone who practices the law and a social advocate yourself, mm -hmm. How much do these protests, people going out and speaking out and not letting the topic just go away, how important is that to all of this in the democratic society where we go cast our vote and we make our voices heard? How much does protest go into that? You know, absolutely, a great question. Uh, as a former NAACP State Youth and College Division President, uh, and as somebody who considers myself to still be an act to, to still be an activist, uh, just in a different capacity now as an elected official, the protests that we saw this year uh, were inspiring. The protests that we saw this year, I think, certainly moved the needle in our country uh, in regards to race relations. Uh, I think Pew had a survey out, you know, that showed that for the first time that people really started understanding uh, some of the racial injustice uh, that, communities, uh, that communities of color and specifically the black community have experienced uh, for generations uh, in the United States of America. Oftentimes, uh, you know, folks uh, have this mindset that we uh, should get over uh, issues of systemic racism or stop talking about things like implicit biases and stop talking about the past. But I think the past is still such a very prevalent uh, portion or, or, or very prevalent today in today's modern society. Um, and, and so I'm certainly inspired by the protests. And I think more people have an understanding of what it means when we say Black Lives Matter. Uh, I think that we have an obligation as elected officials to, to number one, seek understanding. Uh, and I think protests also are important for those in power to hear your voice. 
Uh, one thing that I learned very quickly from a colleague after getting elected is that when people call our offices with concerns, the one thing that I'm telling you an insider secret that a lot of elected officials want to know, uh, the question is, are you my constituent? Uh, and does that, and, and basically, in other words, that means, can you vote for me? And so it's really important that and for those that are listening to this conversation today, that they reach out to their elected officials because you have the power to hire and to fire. And we work for the people, or at least that's who we should be working for. Uh, and so with that being said, we have the power to be the change that we want to see. And I just, I'm listening, uh, I continue to be in awe of all of the social justice, you know, movements that we continue to see in our country. So kudos to you, Jordan, for your advocacy. And, and I'm certainly, I'm certain that those experiences will continue to influence your life as they have mine. Well, you mentioned the fact that a lot of people seem to have a, a deeper understanding and knowledge of what it means to say Black Lives Matter, these issues that are so clearly about race and about peace and about moving the needle in the right direction. And for what is a social issue and a human rights issue, a lot of times gets thrown into the realm of this is a political issue. Mr. Politician, from your professional opinion, tell me, why do so many things that aren't really political in nature get termed as political? Why does that moniker get thrown in front of stuff to just kind of say, yeah, I don't have to discuss it. That's politics. I don't want to talk about it. Certainly. You know, you know, un unfortunately, I think you're right in the sense that far too often things that shouldn't be political become political. Uh, I think leadership is really important. I think that we've got to have leaders that bring us together. We've got to have a leaders that, you know, that, you know, that when, when, when we have debates about Black Lives Matter or Blue Lives Matter or All Lives Matter, I think as a leader, I think that we have to have somebody that can bring all parties to the table uh, and not inflame, you know, these uh, fires that are already raging throughout our country. Uh, and so unfortunately, you know, politics is always at play. Um, but I don't think it's anything new. Uh, if, if you want to go back to the civil, uh, well, back to the Civil War, you know, it, it was fought over, you know, whether or not we keep, you know, hundreds of thousands uh, uh, or millions, uh, rather, uh, of Black folks enslaved in this country. You know, if you go back to the Civil Rights Movement, it was about whether or not we give people uh, of color equal rights in this country. Uh, and so politics has, has always played a role, unfortunately. But I think in the, at the end of the day, I think that uh, justice always prevails. Uh, I think it may take a little bit longer. I think it may be, you know, you know, bloodshed in the sense that people have lost their lives fighting for, for, for equal rights and for justice. But I think at the end of the day, we continue to move the needle and the arc of the universe continues to bend towards justice in our nation. Now on the topic of Black Lives Matter, Jordan, your teammates, you, your teammates, coaches and staff put out a, a really well done video um, where you guys are just each talking about what makes you you, different parts of uh, your personalities. And at the end, you cap it off by saying, look, Black Lives Matter, this is about all of us. This is not just the black guys on the team, the white guys on the team, the coaches, this is about human rights. So that message was really well said and really beautiful. But when you guys were drafting it up, when you're recording the video, out when um, the athletics department sends out the video, were you personally worried at all that there would be people who would hear that line, Black Lives Matter, and just not understand or would be turned off or have some kind of um, adverse reaction to the message that you guys were trying to get out? Um, no, not at all. Um, that didn't cross my mind at all when the video was made or in, in the making of the video, because um, I feel as if I was standing on what was right and what I believe in and I don't I don't I feel as if um, if you're standing on what you believe in and it, and and it's right then it shouldn't be controversial because black lives do matter and so I just go with that just stand on what you believe in and always do the right thing and Darius, uh, uh, if I may, you know, to just piggyback off of Georgia's point, I, I'm really glad to see that so many of our athletes are taking this proactive approach 
And so I'm really inspired, you know, that we're getting back to uh, an era where athletes are, 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 are modeling Muhammad Ali, uh, you know, and speaking out uh, and, and using their platforms, their great platforms, to be voices for change in our country. So that's, that, that's just truly inspiring. Yeah, Muhammad Ali, Jim Brown. I mean, this has a, a lot of precedent. It wasn't just Colin Kaepernick. Like, this has been going on for years with athletes taking the lead. Um, you really do love to see it. So, Jordan, for you to, to be kind of in that same realm, did you guys draw any inspiration from any athletes that come before you um, just in, in a lot of what you're doing right now? Um, definitely. We see it. Uh, the, um, the leagues now, like LeBron, um, Naomi Osaka, um, and just countless others and uh, professional athletes just standing up for what they believe in and what is right. and um, just not worrying about just sacrificing their just sac just sacrificing for the pe their people and their community to uh, speak on what is right, and it's it's just amazing seeing all the uh, leagues come together for one cause. It, it's just beautiful to me. And I mean, it really sounds like you guys have gotten a lot of support from um, from your teammates, obviously, from student athletes uh, across the department, the athletics department, and the university. I mean, do you guys really feel like uh, like everyone's got your back there at Campbell? Yes, definitely. Yeah, they've been leading the way. Coach has definitely been leading the way. Um, I just, I'm, I'm thankful. That's why I, at the beginning of the call, so I'm thankful for the university and the coaches for their support and what's going on in, in the world, because they could turn a blind eye to it, not speak on it, not bring it up, but they're sh they're really getting involved and from trying to be a part of change as well. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, now, we are gonna get to one actual political question. So, Canberra, I'll come to you. Um, I am curious. One note that I did see in the South Carolina House of Representatives that seems kind of unique. The seats aren't arranged strictly by political affiliation where you have one side that's one party, another side is another party you guys are arranged by uh, your county delegation. So I'm curious, this unique seating arrangement, does that kind of help to quell partisanship a little bit within the state house, just because you literally have to sit around people who may not be in the same party as you? Uh, certainly, I, you know, I, I think it makes a, a difference, you know, in, in Washington, this, uh, Washington, D.C., what we see is we see that there are liberals on one side and conservatives on the other side. Uh, but in South Carolina, as you mentioned, we do sit, you know, mixed in. I think it fosters conversation. I think it gives each of us an opportunity to talk to people that are a little bit different from us. And what I will say, and I think this is probably true for most legislative bodies across the nation, is that, you know, that we have our political fights uh, and they're passionate and, you know, and we make our points and they make the other side makes their points. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, I think we can all still leave that conversation, and, you know, and still be friendly uh, and, and still, you know, go out for, you know, uh, you know, for conversation a, a, a later uh, on a personal note. Uh, and so it's, it's, re it's really important that because that's the only way that we're going to get anything done. But I think right now, nationally that we're living in a hyper-partisan environment where the, you know, the old days are where people could, you know, get along and not, you know, keep your word and, and you know, and, and just uh, work together. I think a lot of those days nationally are gone because we're just so, you know, polarized and so divided. Uh, and I do believe that it's going to be up to our next generation of leaders uh, to come in and to rectify that problem. I have a question for uh, yeah, Cameron. Go ahead, Jordan. Uh, do you think that's that's the way that's set up? Do you think it discourages people to speak up if they don't want to step any any toes for the person next to them? I think oftentimes, Jordan, that we get into a group think uh, type of mentality. And, and so from my experience is oftentimes, especially for um, the majority party, I think, you know, they uh, tell their caucus members what to do and how to do it. And, you know, typically everybody falls in line. Uh, so I, I do think to your point that far too often people may think about a situation differently or maybe uh, more, you know, moderate in, in the middle of the road versus far left or far right. But 
what ends up happening is people are worried about their reelection prospects. They're worried about whether or not, you know, somebody's going to primary them in two years or in four years if they aren't conservative enough or if they aren't liberal enough. And so what that what ends up happening is that you have people that are pushed to each each extreme and the moderates are getting unfortunately weeded out and the and in the middle with the moderates is where compromise and deals can be made. So uh, I think that's a, a really great point that you made. Yeah, that was, that was a really good one, Jordan. I'm glad yeah. you brought that up, but um, you both have been fantastic. I do think we could just spend all night talking about the topic of the upcoming election, um, just the way where we are in the country, but I do kind of want to get into some uh, takeaways for each of you um, just right here. So uh, Jordan, we'll start with you. What, 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 what do you think comes next for you as far as um, all the off the court battles. Um, are you looking to talk to any community leaders or just kind of staying involved, having conversations with teammates? Uh, what does what the next step kind of look like for you? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, I definitely encourage, well, I'm, I'm trying to continue the ongoing conversation of what's going on with the teammates and the coaches. Uh, we, we're, we're going to continue to have the, these conversations to uh, further educate myself and the teammate and my teammates on these issues at hand as well as uh i would love to continue to get out there and protest in the community and um show my support so yes i would definitely love to keep having these ongoing conversations about what's going on around us cam bro from one community leader to another do you have any advice for jordan as he continues down that process definitely uh, stay focused, Jordan. I mean, oh, your future, man, is so bright. Um, I, I think uh, that you have so much to offer the world uh, and you have a platform uh, that, you know, it, folks listen to you. Folks follow you, you know, just naturally. So uh, use that platform for good. Um, use that platform, uh, you know, not just, oftentimes what I see is when folks are successful, they forget, as my mother would say, the bridges that brought them over. Uh, but use your platform and use your success to reach back and to, you know, mentor and, and to look out for that next generation. But I have no doubt that, I have no doubt that you won't do that already. Yeah, I mean, Jordan, I mean, point guard, you can't be a point guard without being a leader, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's in your DNA, man. Uh, Cambrell, so for you, what, what comes next? I mean, obviously, you're going to continue in your role as a South Carolina state representative, but uh, what other measures do you have in your arena as politician, lawyer? What else do you have going on? Certainly. I just want to continue to be a voice for the voiceless. Um, if anybody ever reads my story, you'll know that at the age of five, I was diagnosed with a speech impediment. And my mother actually changed her career to become a speech therapist to help me overcome that challenge. Uh, and so I think that I've been blessed with this voice for a reason. And, if that, and I want to use it to be a champion for those who don't have a voice. I, I want to champion causes that I believe in, uh, whether that be at the state house or whether that be in the courtroom, uh, just advocating for, the, uh, for those who need an advocate uh, and, and somebody to just you know, stand in the gap and, and just be you know, a fighter for them. So I don't know what comes next in regards to politics. I'm certainly happy where I am in the state house. I think I have a, a, a huge platform to be able to be a force for good uh, in our state. Uh, and oftentimes what I've learned is that in South Carolina, being in the minority party, uh, you know, being a Democrat in the minority party and a Republican dominated General Assembly, um, so many of the issues that we talk about as Democrats uh, are oftentimes ignored or, or, or overlooked. Uh, but I think eventually uh, we continue to talk about them and, and to continue to fight for them until, you know, others come along. And so as we are in this wilderness period, uh, as a minority party here in South Carolina, I'm going to continue to be that voice uh, for those issues that are uh, of importance to my community and to better the lives of my constituents. All right. Well said. Well, thank you both for joining us on Culture Conversations with the Big South. So as we close, uh, are there any organizations along the lines of getting ready for this election or in the fight against racial injustice um, that you'd like to highlight? Um, Jordan, starting with you, anyone that you kind of want to give a shout out to? Yes, definitely. I would love to give a shout out to uh, Chris Clements for his role in the community and um, for his leadership in the community of um, leading protests 
uh, using his platform to further um, the conversation on racial injustice. And um, his clothing line, his brand, or which you can find at officialchrisclemens.com, uh, he's highlighting the names of the victims that's been, that fell to, uh, that died to um, police shootings. And, but yeah, I'll shout out to what he's doing in the community. Uh, so same for you, Cambrell. Um, who would you like to kind of give a shout out for? Yeah, so Fair Fight it, it is a group that I want to say was established by Stacey Abrams, uh, the former gubernatorial candidate down in Georgia, who has been pushing, and, you know, if you know anything about her election, you'll know that she uh, lost in a close election uh, with, where there were cases of voter suppression, purging of the voter rolls down in Georgia. And so Stacey Abrams has been uh, on a, a journey the past uh, year or so or, or longer uh, to just ensure that every vote counts and that, you know, everyone knows where to vote, uh, how to vote, and that sort of thing. So fairfight.com. Uh, also, I want to shout out when we all vote so folks can go and check their voter registration status uh, and, and that sort of thing. But I just want to say thank you to, to your organization for, first of all, highlighting these conversations and, and bringing Jordan and I uh, together on today because far too often I think folks – uh, talk a good talk, but, you know, become complicit uh, a, a, as well or don't want to, you know, um, you know, step into the cultural debates uh, of the day. So just uh, thank you for, you know, using your platform to uh, share a message with others. And we hope that, you know, somebody listened today and learned a little bit more from what we had to say. Certainly. From a broadcast perspective, I'd like to mention the Black Play-by-Play -play Fund. It's for Black broadcasters, play-by-play -play broadcasters who are in college or fresh out of college looking to get a start just so we can have that representation in the broadcast booth in addition to what we see on the court and on the field of play. All right, thank you both for joining us and thank you viewers for joining us as well. This has been another edition of Cultural Conversations with the Big South. We'll see you next time.